Welcome to the LDN Radio Show, brought to you by the LDN Research Trust. I'm your host, Linda Elsigood. I have an exciting lineup of guest speakers who are LDN experts in their field. We will be discussing low dose naltrexone and its many uses in autoimmune diseases, cancers, etc. Thank you for joining us. This show is sponsored by Dixon's Chemist, who are the experts in LDN and associated treatments in the UK. Dixon's Chemist are the most cost-effective for LDN in all forms within the UK and Europe, maintaining safety standards far in excess of what is required. Why would you choose to get your LDN from anywhere else? Call 0141 404 6545 today to speak to their LDN experts. Today my guest is Dr Sarah McAllister, who's the owner of Children's Naturopathic Clinic in Portland, Oregon. Thank you for joining us today, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Well, by being the owner of the Children's Naturopathic Centre, I would say that your patients are mainly children. So could you tell us how you got involved in being a naturopathic doctor and specialising in children? Yeah, so I was actually a biochemistry major in Canada and planning on going in mainstream medicine. Um, always planned on doing pediatrics. That's where my passion's always been. Um, and I was volunteering with children with chronic illnesses and realizing that while there's fantastic care for them on so many levels, there's sort of a missing element to medicine when children don't fit inside the the medical box um, and just feeling that maybe there was something additionally we could offer to these kids um, along with the therapies that they were undergoing. Um, I have a sister who's a naturopathic physician who, who specializes in cancer treatments. And so I had a conversation with her about just what it was that she was doing and decided to go forth and try this form of medicine out. And so I specialize in working with children with chronic illnesses, and I do integrative medicine um, for a variety of different health complaints. Mm -hmm. And you were saying that you can prescribe as well, so that must be a, an additional bonus for you. Well, yeah, I mean, there's just no way. I, I I don't believe in one form of medicine over another. I think it's a short-sighted way to look at healthcare. Um, and there's there's just, it, it's very limiting if you don't have all of the options out there for treating kids because there's a time and a place for everything, for mm -hmm. sure. So mm -hmm. you say that um, you treat children with chronic illnesses. What conditions do you mainly mm -hmm. see? Um, I see a lot of children um, on the autistic spectrum, um, sensory processing disorders, behavioral issues. Um, I see, uh, well, I'm starting to see more and more kids with a disorder called PANS or PANDAS, which is an autoimmune condition um, that comes on after infections that results in a sudden onset of um, ticks and OCD and feeding disorders. Um, I see children with chronic eczemas, autoimmune thyroid issues, Crohn's, um, and then what we call the orphan diseases, which are rare uh, genetic disorders that result in a variety of, of health spectrum issues um, that we don't have a whole lot of information about because they are so rare. Um, and I tend to see all of those children. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what about things like um, juvenile arthritis and Crohn's disease, eczema? Yep, definitely. Yeah. Yep. Crohn's disease, eczema, IBS, um, cyclical vomiting syndrome, chronic migraines, all of that stuff. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, the vomiting thing is terrible, isn't it? Especially in young babies that are still either breastfeeding or uh, having a bottle when they take it down and just bring it back up again. It must be very distressing for parents. Distressing for the parents and difficult. I mean, the children aren't growing and thriving like they need to. So it starts resulting in developmental delays and everything else just because they're not getting the nutrients that they need to make their milestones. Mm. Okay. So if 
a patient comes with you with a baby that is crying, mm -hmm. uh, who doesn't settle, mm -hmm. isn't feeding properly, what are the first steps you take? Well, the first, I mean, the first thing that I, you know, I love about my medicine is that I'm given my, my intake appointments are an hour and a half, uh, which That's really, long, isn't it? my first step, it is long. Um, although when my kids come in with 15 specialists, it sometimes doesn't feel quite long enough when you're <laughs> catching up because my, my number one thing that I do is I take a history. Um, and I think all doctors know this. I mean, the majority of medicine if you take a good history, you can find out what's going on or at least direct you um, pretty clearly where you need to go. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll ask about what, you know, in utero development was like and what the birth was like and was it a C-section or was it, you know, a vaginal birth and what were the health issues when the baby was born and were they put on antibiotics right away and you know, the, the, the full review of symptoms. Um, and that's where I typically start with a kid before I even go anywhere else, um, especially for the younger kids, because there's only so much that can go wrong um, first thing in life. Um, that's not sort of a, a acute illness that's caught right away in the hospital, obviously. Um, but for these more subtle issues, you know, they, they're not out there eating lots of foods and, and having stressful lives or anything else like that. So there's just, there's, generally a few areas that go wrong that need that need stability or support mm -hmm. and once you've taken this very detailed history mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what's the next step well so <laughs> it's a complicated question because it depends on what what comes from that history you know if i have a parent whose child has eczema all over their body and has horrible diaper rashes and abnormal stooling and is throwing up, um, then I'm going to start looking at if there's any food sensitivity issues um, or if there's any intestinal issues, um, which I see a lot of in kids who have been born C-section where I just feel like they don't get the bacterial flora that they were supposed to have gotten. Um, our hospitals by necessity are very sterile, mm -hmm. um, but if they're not coming out through the vaginal tract, they're also not getting that bacteria that goes in. And so they end up with some pretty interesting abnormal bacteria that's growing in their guts, um, which are not pathogenic in the means of, you know, causing acute diarrheal issues, um, but can definitely um, start some of those eczemas and those chronic illnesses that we'll see with like food intolerances, um, but even it, through the mother's breast milk. Oh, that's what mm -hmm. I was going to say. <clears throat> so if a baby mm -hmm. was being breastfed or bottle fed and you found mm -hmm. that they were intolerant to milk, mm -hmm. be it the parents or the dried milk formula, Yep. What's the alternative that they can have? So when breastfeeding, I generally find that the, the babies are not intolerant to the mother's breast milk. They're intolerant to either the cow or the goat or whatever form of milk that the mother is um, ingesting herself. Mm -hmm. So we just put the mother on a food-restricted diet. Um, and the rule of thumb with all of these is you pull out... Um, the most common allergens um, and have the mum off them for about three weeks and then you bring one food in at a time and then you watch for symptoms within the baby. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's, yeah. that's quite amazing. What about the if they were using formula? Is there a special formula? That's um... Yeah, so formulas are tricky. <laughs> so oftentimes, um, you know, we'll just start by putting them on some of the elemental um, drinks. So they're the ones where the proteins have been broken down. Um, the smaller the protein, the less likely they are to, to react to it. So the nutramogens and elemental formulas are where we often start. Um, the downside to them is that they still have corn syrups and other things, which some babies can, can have a problematic issue with. Um, and then it starts getting, we have to get a little more creative if that, if that's going on. Um, but I find nine times out of 10 children who are having issues um, with a bottle um, will be able to do one of the elemental formulas without issue. Mm -hmm. My friend's baby couldn't take uh, formula milk and she had mm -hmm. to switch to goat's milk and she was absolutely right. fine. I mean, is that, I know people who are 
uh, dairy free, don't have goat's milk mm. or cow's milk. But is yeah goat's milk good for babies? Well, yes and no. The thing that we run into with goat milk is that the protein concentration is so much higher in it. It depends on the age of the child. So if we're dealing with infants, we have to really watch out for kidney issues, which can come up when you're doing goat milk. Um, you know, obviously, if the child is not getting anything else down, uh, then goat milk is the lesser of the evil. But you can't do just like a straightforward goat milk. There are goat milk formulas which have been modified to be appropriate for infants. And those are the ones that I recommend versus people making up their own formulas. Um, just because, I, you know, obviously, we have to really maintain the health of the kidneys. That's paramount in an infant at that age, particularly. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, goat milk still has the casein and whey in it but it's surrounded by different sugars and those sugars are a little more similar to breast milk. So they're, they're a little bit more easily digestible for kids. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they, they can have less immune response to them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to talk for a moment about autism. Sure. I've listened to a few lectures on autism, but yeah. how do you know when a, a child, a young child is likely to be autistic? How, how old would you say it is before you can notice? I think that's my question. Yeah. Well, and, and autism is a, is a tricky beast in that way and that it, it can show up at various ages. Um, I have a patient right now, who actually has a rare form of autism called Heller syndrome, which the child was progressing normally up until four and a half before any issues showed up. Um, that one is not as well recognized. The typical onset or what we find in children is around 18 months um, when it's enough of the patterns are there that they're typically caught. Generally, when you talk to those parents, there are clues that are going on earlier. Um, some of the more involved cases are kids who are more impacted. You can see as young as, you know, six, seven months in terms of just their social integration with people is the, is the most typical. And then you start to see some delayed milestones in terms of not crawling, not walking, not talking. Um, and then it sort of progresses from there versus other kids who have what we call the more regressive type autism, where it seems like they're progressing and you, not, you know, I mean, they're, they're meeting all their milestones and look very peer appropriately until they hit sort of that 18 months uh, to three year marker. Mm -hmm. Now, if you find there's a child um, only a few months old that you think it's possibly um, has got autism, what treatment mm -hmm. can you do? Can you help prevent it or help the child to develop normally? What do you do? Well, preventing autism, I, I don't think there's a prevention <laughs> at this point. And I, I don't think there's a prevention because I don't think we I mean we know that there's a genetic component and an environmental component um, but when you don't know the cause it's, it's very hard to prevent something I think that you can put some really good care into place um, so that children maybe are never labeled um, or if they're labeled are labeled with a much milder form um, treatments that I, I always when I'm concerned about a kid's development, we'll get them into, you know, physical therapy, speech therapy, um, ABA therapy, you know, by far um, has the most literature behind it. Um, and I see a lot of clinical impacts by getting kids into those sorts of therapies very early. I also find from a, a naturopathic standpoint or an integrative doctor standpoint, you know, getting the fish oils into them and the B vitamins and making sure there's no mineral or vitamin deficiencies um, can really help. And that's, that's just coming down to the fact that in these kids, we're trying to give them a leg up. I always use the example that health is a bit like an onion. And I, I don't think that necessarily the diet causes the disease or the vitamin deficiency causes the disease, but they're definitely not helping them. And so if we can kind of give them a boost off and, and peel a few layers off that onion, then it's a few less layers they're having to work through when they're working on their social cognition and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. 
What kind of diet do you suggest children to follow who have got autism? Because we all know children, if they could choose, I think would probably choose junk food over healthy food. Right. <clears throat> Yeah, and this is true. I don't think it's different. My conversation with parents with autism is is much different in terms of the younger ages than my children who don't have autism and that I'm a big believer in whole foods, non-processed foods. Um, We eat a lot of sugar in this country. Uh, We eat a lot of food dyes. We eat a lot of, you know, crackers and chips um, and just getting kids back to eating the vegetables and the fruits and the healthy fats and the proteins, which sounds very elementary, but it's something that's not talked about very often. And when you look at what children are eating these days, um, it's not common to see kids eating a whole diet that way. Um, What you put in your body is a building blocks for every single biochemical thing that you do. And if you're not feeding it appropriately, how can you expect it to work well? Um, so my first step with children with autism is really just to get them on as much healthy food um, and a good variety of food versus, I mean, a lot of kids on the spectrum want to eat like two things, like garlic toast is one of the things that I run into a lot or, you know, all white things and they're not, or they'll eat all veggies and they won't eat protein or they'll eat no veggies and nothing but meat and cheese. Um, so a lot of times my first thing is just trying to get food into them um, and to work with their therapist as well to increase uh, textural, um, uh, avoid uh, textural avoidances. Um, and so I'm working on that front. And then obviously there's there's lots of different diets out there that people have found effective depending on how impacted my kids. I mean, some of the kids with autism, you wouldn't even know. I mean, we know they have autism because we've been checked, but it's a fairly mild form. Um, oftentimes with them, I'll explore at some point or another a gluten and dairy free diet just because of the amount of literature that's out there. Um, I'll also do food allergy testing and sensitivity testing on kids before I do um, any eliminations just because I think eliminating foods are really hard for children um, and it's hard to feed them in the first place. Um, So that just gives us a starting point. I mean, obviously the gold standard with anything is you pull the food out and bring it back in and see if you see benefits or, or negatives when you bring them back in. Um, so that's there. I I reserve, I mean, there's the GAPS diet out there. I think it's a really intense diet. I think that it can result in a lot of caloric deficiencies if people aren't good about it. So I really don't do the GAPS diet unless I have a kid that's severely impacted with a lot of health issues aside from just their autism. Um, so carbohydrate specific diet, um, is a little more moderate and we'll sometimes look into that, but it depends on where the family is at too, because giving a family member who's struggling with 20 therapies a week, uh, a huge different diet change, it's just not going to happen. So I have to, I have to meet the family where they're at too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, gut issues, you know, Crohn's disease, mm-hmm. and do children get ulcerative colitis? IBS, yes. celiac, yes, all of those. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all of the above. Yeah. yeah. And, and children are tricky. I mean, you mentioned the celiac. I find, it, you know, celiac is a specific reaction to gluten where the antibodies are attacking the intestinal lining. Um, and it takes a while for that diagnosis to show up. And so I actually will have kids that, I mean, I think they're actually progressing into the celiac um, symptomology, but if you catch them early enough, they don't present with necessarily the same GI stuff, even though it is a GI issue. Um, they might be presenting with migraines or joint pains or skin issues and chronic tummy aches far before they ever start doing, you know, the bloody stooling and the loss of weight that comes with the celiac diagnosis itself. What about yeah. SIBO? Yes, see a lot of that too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, are you asking a specific question about SIBO or is it, do I see it in children? No, I, was just, I was just wondering, yes, if, if you saw it in children, I just wondered if it was something that maybe came later in life rather than when you were very young. It's not. I actually have seen quite a few children um, with SIBO in my practice um, and they're oftentimes been misdiagnosed with the constipation um, and are on Miralax um, or other similar things, but um, they typically will have a fairly, a much clearer picture than adults will. 
Um, I think adults have been dealing with it for so long, they don't necessarily remember what the starting point was. I'll see it, SIBO on my kids um, after they've had a GI infection or after they've been on a prolonged course of antibiotics for repeated ear infections, and then they come in with all the classic symptoms of SIBO and, and surprisingly do have most of the same symptoms that adults would have that you would associate with SIBO, sort of the poor breath and the gas and the bloating and the alternating constipation and diarrhea. So. Mm-hmm. And is it easy to treat in children? I mean, do you have to put them? I mean, I've had sea and I was on the FODMAP diet, which was really hard. And I was just trying to imagine putting a child on a SIBO, um FODMAP diet. Yeah, the FODMAP diet. No, this is, I always laugh and I tell people this is why I chose to practice pediatrics because their bodies are all geared towards healing um, versus, you know, you hit a certain age and you're, you're really just breaking apart at that point. <laughs> um, so children... I'm very lucky in that oftentimes, you know, you give them, you give them a little boost and they are able to take care of it themselves. Until I hit the teenage years, I often don't have to do the FODMAPs or the, the SIBO diets. Um, I oftentimes can treat them, um, you know, I do like a low dose naltrexone, I'll do um, an antibiotic with them, I'll do herbals with them and find that just by getting them on that course, uh, we do re- reduce sugars, we do make some dietary modifications, but it's it's by no means what adults have to do or, or teenagers have to do on that front. Um, and I find if you do that and you get them into a good place that they just take over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The biggest thing for them is that I find children are much more sensitive to probiotics than adults are. And there's already a huge discrepancy about people within the SIBO community about whether or not you should be giving probiotics. Um, And I find that's even more true with children. You have to go really low and really slow if you're going to add additional probiotics and when they've got the SIBO diagnosis. Mm -hmm. How about treating, you mentioned teenagers there, teenagers, Mm -hmm. peer pressure, Mixing with friends, eating at friends' houses. How do children manage to eat differently, maybe, than their peers? I think that, I mean, that's always something that we run into. I think, for better or worse, the children that I'm treating generally feel pretty terribly. um, And they're pretty on board with feeling better. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I always tell kids, listen, we're not doing this for life. You give me, you know, three to four weeks and let's see if we can get you to feel better. And then I'll let you trial things into your diet. My experience with kids is once they know that a food really doesn't make them feel good, that there's no temptation on their part. Um, and so they just learn just like an adult does how to eat around the menu or to bring things with them, um, because they feel so poorly. Mm-hmm. So teenagers, they generally feel like will be on board with us and will help us um, manage their health. The hardest ages are actually the 10, 11, and 12-year-olds who are a little bit more impulsive, um, not quite to that teenage rational thinking. Um, you know, so so they can tend to do it more times and still not make the connections versus mm-hmm. the little, you know, whatever mommy tells them to do, they're sort of very strict on themselves, <laughs> uh-huh. which is, which is very helpful, but they, they won't put anything in their mouth if mommy said no, or daddy said no. So, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so pans, stroke pandas. Yeah. Could you explain yeah. that a little bit more? Um, so pans is an umbrella term and pandas fits under that. And what it is, is when a child has been exposed to infection, in the case of pandas, it's a streptococcal infection, but it can be any bacterial or virus and they get sick and their body very appropriately responds with an immune response to fight off the illness. Um, but then it gets a little haywire and it creates an autoimmune issue where those antibodies that are supposed to be attacking the virus or bacteria end up attacking the neuronal tissue. Um, And we specifically know that some of the dopamine receptors and CAM2 kinases are some of the links and that particular areas in the brain um, that we associate with food eating disorders, et cetera, are, are all targeted. So these kids will get sick and then after their illness will come on with a very sudden onset of um, OCD type behavior. 
triggers, um, uh, onset ticks. Um, I'll have kids that suddenly have ADHD that never had ADHD before. Um, and, and so it's a wide set or eating disorders that will come out of the blue, um, severe anxiety or generalized anxiety. And this all comes from the infection. And then what will happen to these kids is first you have to really curb them down. If you don't get this immune response under wraps fast, um, then they end up. And I mean, I've had kids that are in the neuropsych ward um, because of how really? bad their symptoms have gotten. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's 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 out of the blue really bad symptomology. Um, And then what unfortunately happens is that now in the case of pandas, every time if they get exposed to strep, whether or not they get the infection, the body mounts the immune response because it's protecting itself, which is good, except that they end up also then having a flare up in their panda symptoms. And so these kids will sort of go through this waxing and waning of these OCDs and tics and anxiety issues um, that can be really hard. I mean, some kids have a milder form, but a lot of the kids I've seen are are very greatly impacted and it's it's a big deal. So Mm. that is one of the conditions that I treat. And when you say tics, um, for people Mm -hmm. that don't know, um, Oh, sorry. It, it, Neurological ticks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's it, it's like uh, the ticks that people with um, Tourette's have, where you move yep. involuntary. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it can be both a motor or a verbal. Um, yes. So some kids will grunt or snort or cough, um, which we consider a vocal tick, mm-hmm. um, versus the motor ticks. Um, and the, they can be very mild, um, anywhere from just like blinking your eyes a lot. Um, to very extreme, like hopping and jumping and twirling and, and the whole bit. Is there any treatment you can have to try and stop those yeah. flares? Yeah, so PANS or PANDAS is, it's actually, we've known about it for quite a while. Um, it's a more controversial diagnosis, um, but it's gaining, there's more and more research coming out of Stanford. Um, and so more and more doctors are becoming aware of it, but there's a lot of docs who don't know about it. And the first thing I always tell parents is you have to get, you have to find someone who knows what PANS is, because if you don't know what PANS is, your kid's going to end up on, you know, an SSRI or anti tourette type medicine, which they may need, but you're not going to be dealing with the underlying issue and they're not going to get better. Mm -hmm. Um, Once you know a kid has PANS or PANDAS, um, you know, there's a blood workup that we do just to try to see if we can figure out what the instigating organism is. Um, If we know that they had a strep throat, we'll oftentimes make sure that we put those kids on uh, antibiotic um, just because we want to clear out the bacteria so that they don't keep mounting that immune response to it. Um, some cases, uh, we end up putting, um, kids on IVIG therapies or a steroidal pulse therapy just to get that immune system down. Um, all of my PANS kids are on low-dose naltrexone, um, for the autoimmune component of it. Um, so, and, and then there's, you know, you just, you kind of have to meet the kid based on where they're at and what symptoms they've they've picked up. But the, the first thing is just anything that practitioners have, um, one, to fight the infection, and then two, just to have that infl- anti-inflammatory um, component, like ibuprofen even, are, are used um, quite well by a majority of patients when they have a flare-up just to, to curb those symptoms. Well, that sounds really horrendous, doesn't it? <laughs> An awful thing. To yeah, it, it, it's, it's, not, it's not fun. It's not no. fun. So how old um, is a, a child likely to be? I mean, babies don't get it, do they? I haven't seen any babies. I don't think I would know even how to recognize that in a baby. Um, uh, The youngest kid that I've seen with a PANS um, was four, um, and they got it after being in hospital um, for rheumatic fever, um, and all their symptoms came on after that. Um, And that was probably the youngest one. I see... It's not uncommon to see it crop up between the ages of four and seven mm-hmm. um, for a lot of kids. Typically below 10, most kids have had their first symptoms. I don't, you don't tend to see teenagers necessarily do it that haven't had symptoms of it in the past. Um, this, we definitely find it. Yeah. This might sound a silly question. Would they have yeah. had it in them anyway and it was just triggered or 
do circumstances. Yeah. So I've had kids come to me before where I'm giving them their diagnosis at 13 or 14. Um, but when we look back, um, parents are like, well, there was that phase where, you know, they started kindergarten and they had like three strep infections. And I remember they had really bad separation anxiety, but we figured it was just, you know, the, um, the fact that she was in kindergarten, mm -hmm. But she was obsessively washing her hands, too, and we did have some food restrictions. But then she just kind of pulled out of it. Um, and that I have heard that before where I feel like their initial flare was actually younger. Um, but just due to the nature of their symptoms and the timing of their symptoms wasn't necessarily recognized for what it was. So do they continue to have it as they grow to adults or does it? Well... What we have found with pans and pandas is that if you can treat them mm. um, and treat them aggressively, in my practice particularly, I find that if I can get them sort of two years symptom free, that we're generally home free. Really? Um, when you, yeah, when you read the research articles, um, a lot of doctors are finding that the majority of their kids, if they're treated appropriately, seem to have these flare-ups that last up to sort of into the puberty time and then after that um, diminish and we don't see it the same way. Um, and then there's the articles that are coming out that show that when people haven't been treated appropriately um, for, you know, just not recognized, um, that they tend to be the ones that seem to carry on with the symptoms into adulthood. So there is a, there is a, a really big push in my office to try to get these kids symptoms treated appropriately and quickly mm -hmm. um, so that we're not creating a long-term health issue for them. Certainly. You did mention mm -hmm. OCD. Yes. Um, could you explain what that's like in your practice with the, with the children? Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. Obsessive compulsive disorder is really interesting. Um, and it's oftentimes not caught because parents don't know that children are doing rituals. They keep it to themselves. So I will see kids where I figure out that they have an OCD going on and that are coming in really for just, um, you know, rigidity and behaviors and anxiety or, or emotional ability where they're just going from zero to 60 reaction wise um, without any prompting that they can see because the parent doesn't realize that what's happened is that they've, you know, pulled them down the sidewalk and that because of that, they touched the crack that was in their head oh. that they weren't allowed to, to mm -hmm. touch. So little children can be a little bit harder to catch um, unless you start asking them some of the right questions. Um, I've had kids where they're curling their toes and their shoes um, and they have to do it a certain number of times um, or touching. They have to touch the desk a certain number of times. Um, kids will have routines at bedtime. It's a really common to, si to see in the kids under seven where they need the bedtime's routine to go just so, um, which, you know, parents can be like, well, my kid, you know, he's a kid and kids like routine, but there's a different element to it where you have to restart the, the routine if you're not doing it right, or there's a lot of mood and, and behavioral upset that comes from it if it's not done right in terms of the pillow going just so. Um, kindergartners and above, I, I do see a lot of hand washing that comes out of them. Um, I can see rigidity around foods in terms of what we can eat and how the food is presented and where it can touch. Um, and then there's the classic OCD that we'll see, um, like I said before, like touching things a certain number of times, um, you know, having to jump over imaginary walls to go from one room to the other, um, spinning in circles to go through a door. Those are all things that I've seen in my office, wow. so. Mm -hmm. um, is it easy Which is, you know, treat? it takes its toll. Yeah. Uh, you know, yes and no. I mean, I do think that integrative medicine has an, a lot to offer these kids. I think that there can be um, quite a few triggers um, and things in the inflammatory world that when you address them can make it significantly better. Um I, it, uh, it oftentimes involves therapy too. We find cognitive behavioral therapy for for these kids is really important. Um, but I also look at, you know, food intolerances and B vitamin deficiencies um, and other things on that front too, magnesium deficiencies that can make a significant drop in the OCD tendencies um, 
if not resolve them. And then there's SSRIs and all the rest of it for kids when we can't get there from a more holistic approach. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, we're coming to the end of the, the radio show. Would you like mm-hmm. to tell people how they can contact you? Sure. Um, I have a website. It's ndforkids.com. Um, and you can go there, um, and it's N D and then a number four and then kids. Um, and that is my website. Uh, my phone number is 503-224-2590 and people can contact me that through the office. Um, yeah. And those are probably the best ways to reach me. (laughs) And do you have a waiting list? I do, uh, but it fluctuates, and so I always tell people just get your name down on the wait list because when people cancel, we just call through and oh, and um, get people in. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you must be an absolute godsend to parents that have a child that has one of these issues that we've been talking about. It must be mentally and physically draining for them. I I, I think parents. Are, are amazing people and I think parents do some very amazing things um, and I'm always so impressed by um, what families are able to do to help meet their children's needs mm-hmm. because it's not it's not an easy path for a lot of these families and not necessarily the path that they planned on going on um, and and parents really rise to the occasion on so many amazing ways for these kids so but to work alongside a doctor such as yourself that can offer the help and support they need, it, it must just be light at the end of the tunnel. I always hope so. I mean, I always tell people I, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, that if I can take some of this burden off of them, um, even if it's not me treating them, but just getting them where they need to go, then um, I, I, I'm honoured to be part of that path for them. Mm. Well, to some for someone to give you guidance even, you know, telling, could because when yeah, you get well, children, they don't come with a manual, do they? You, you can't just they look don't. it up. Yeah, they don't come with a manual. And for better or for worse, we, with these kids with chronic illnesses, we have a lot of specialists. So parents will be going from one specialist to the other. Um, but oftentimes there's not someone who's helping them navigate all of those different specialties Mm -hmm. and explaining to them what's really going on. And, and that's, that's a really key part is having someone that's at the hub of their cycle. That's sort of, that's helping direct them and letting them know what's going on and integrating it all because the brain is not separate from the gut, from the hand. I mean, it's all one body. So Mm -hmm. um, it can be very overwhelming for parents and they can get a little confused as to why they're going from one place to the next, because it's not often explained. Mm -hmm. So Well, thank you very much for being such a perfect uh, guest with us today, Sarah. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. This show is sponsored by Dixon's Chemist, who are the experts in LDN and associated treatments in the UK. Dixon's Chemist are the most cost-effective for LDN in all forms within the UK and Europe maintaining safety standards far in excess of what is required. Why would you choose to get your LDN from anywhere else? Call 0141 404 6545 today to speak to their LDN experts. Any questions or comments you may have, please email me, linda, L-I-N-D-A, at ldnrt.org. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciated your company. Until next time, stay safe and keep well.